When looking for the king of podcasts, you're at the wrong channel. Well, excuse me! Looking for good ideas for life? You're far from good hands. Hey, bud, what's your problem? If you think the listener is always right, you're far from the right place. Out of order! Even in the future, nothing works! Hosted by a Northeasterner by birth, but a rebel by choice. Are you threatening me? If you want a host that floats between love and madness, and we know the night is always gonna be here anyway. Thinking of you's working up my appetite, looking forward to a little afternoon delight. Then play on and listen to Crazy Train Radio. All right, guys, uh, listen to the blues riff and B. Watch me for the changes and try and keep up, okay? Warning, creators of this game do understand the subject matter may be offensive to some, but they do honor the families and people that have been affected by these real life tragedies that these individuals have caused. Wanna play a game? Oh yeah! Lover of true crime? Yes, yes, yes. Well, we got an interesting game for you to check out. Wow. With the mashup of influences such as horror movies, collecting cards, and RPGs. What? Led to giving birth to an incredible creation of this game. Killers, the card game. You are all my children now. This game is a collectible trading card game featuring some of the most infamous killers with tidbits of trivia on the back of each card to help you learn some insight to each criminal. Who the hell are you? Let's not forget, during the game, cops will be chasing you and these criminals. I'm a cop, you idiot! However, check out their website listed through all social media today, which can be found under Killers, the card game. Am I on the internet? I want to play a game. Hey everyone, I'm George Simon. I want you to know, I do a lot of podcasts. I love doing podcasts. And I've got a new one that I love doing. And I want you to listen to it. Crazy Train Radio. Another one of the best. You'll enjoy it. Hey folks, it's your least favorite host in a podcast world, Croc, Jonathan Steele. And boy, do we have a good one for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I'd like to thank Mr. Brian Young for making this happen. But we are talking old school wrestling one-on-one this time. I had this gentleman as part of a panel we did last week, and we are, but this man is an encyclopedia of the AWA. The guy right there, yeah, as he's looking around looking for the encyclopedia. Looking for the guy you're talking about. Yeah, where is this guy? Yeah, it's amazing. (laughs) But he, I should say this guest, is probably most recently known for his book, Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling, from Vern Gagne to the Road Warriors. He also runs Wrestling Time Machine on Facebook, the group, Mr. George Shire. George, how the hell are you? I'm great. 
I'm great. Boy, when you said encyclopedia, I don't think my grandchildren even know what that word means if I use it. So, sometimes what, it's we have not a, Google. Sometimes, well, I don't know. Sometimes we have a foreign language today with social media. And when you're old like me, you can throw stuff out there and they go, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> then they'll type on Google and be on their phone. Uh, yeah. So, like I said there for this, for the intro, we did do the Triple B panel, which was Mr. Young's yeah. idea. What were your thoughts or what are your thoughts of how that went? Oh, I think it was interesting. Um, it was it was a new concept, obviously. I know Brian had just picked out uh, three champions, the three Bs, as he called them. And uh, it was Bruno, Briscoe, and Bachwinkle. And then he had uh, myself. And uh, now you got to help me with the other two. Holy cow. Mr. West and Nikita Brezhnikov. Yeah, yeah, Nikita Brezhnikov. Holy cow. And and Mr. West, Rodney West. Yes. And it was great. Um, Great perspectives put by both of those gentlemen. What what Ryan wanted, he he wanted us to make it kind of a debate, make our case for who was the better B, if you will. And uh, I'm going to say that I think it was a three-way tie. It was a draw. I think we both, all three of us, I think we made just great points. I mean, and we were talking about three, hold up three fingers, Shire, uh, three of the best of the old kayfabe era without any questions. So that yeah, was fun. Yeah. Amazing concept. And to you represented the AWA and Nick Bachwinkle. Yeah. And obviously I know Nick's work and all that fun stuff. And the one thing I didn't know which you brought up during your initial volley, as you would say, is involving with his training. And I didn't know Luthez was involved with the training. Obviously, I knew he was a generational guy with his father and such. So that was kind of cool to know. You know what was really good about the the whole, as we called it, a debate, because it really was, but it was very friendly. Mm -hmm. Um, I found that had you given me Bruno... I could have made the case for Bruno being the best and the same for Briscoe. And I'm sure the other two guys, Nikita and Rodney West, would have said the same thing. Um, It kind of reminded me back to my old high school debate days when that's exactly what we had to do. We were given a topic, usually in political in nature, but we were given a topic and we had to convince the group of people listening to us that this was fact kids this was the way it is this is the best way it was and then they would get us and they'd turn us around and say okay now you're going to take the other point of view and be equally as convincing and i i used to love that Uh, we used to go to different high schools and have uh contests between the schools so yeah it was the first time i've been involved with that And, and brian young uh if you're listening i probably will thank you and i think we could pull it off with the three c's or the three the three M's or whatever, just pick three wrestlers from the air. And I think we could do an equally well and fun job. Plus you learn stuff as you go through. And uh, I forget who mentioned it, but somebody said along the lines of, wow, I forgot about this. Or then it would turn into a left-hand turn. And well, what about this, this, and that? And, yeah. Well, and, that, and, that, and you know, that is the, the unique thing about, uh, old school wrestling in general. Um, We, you know, my era, we had the opportunity to see so many different wrestlers, so many different territories, so many different gimmicks, so many different concepts, ways of promoting. Uh, We saw wrestlers in baby faces and as heels, and we saw them in different names. and, And there's no way you can't learn something every day. Um, I was just talking to somebody the other day and they said, well, gee, I didn't know that three bird Buddy Roberts, who was also one of the Hollywood blondes along with Jerry Brown, but that he wrestled in the AWA in the early years under the tutelage of Vern Gagne. And he wrestled under the name of Buddy Smith. 
and and just a just a young kid in 1969. And the picture, in fact, it, it involved a picture that had been posted. And uh, he looked nothing like the Buddy Roberts from the Freebirds or the Hollywood Blondes that we knew. But, uh, yeah, we learned stuff. And that's what keeps me going every day. I, um, I wake up every day and I work something wrestling every single day for some part of the day. And I, I usually, myself, I learn stuff. And then I like sharing stuff. I think it's I think it's important if our if our newer generation is willing to learn and wanting to know about how it evolved and the wrestlers that set the pace for today's product. Um, I'm here. I'm here. And guys like me, we're here to share it with. You. We'll talk all day. And it's important to pick the brains. That's for sure. Because that's yeah. how I learned yeah. and everything else. But you also brought up a good point with putting minnesota in the title of the book what why was that um well the 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 book my book minnesota's golden age of wrestling is published by the minnesota historical society press which is the minnesota history center in downtown saint paul here in minnesota um, if anyone ever comes here and wants to visit a great historical Minnesota museum, uh, I would encourage you to do that. But what they did was I had approached them with, well, actually I had approached several publishers with the idea of doing a book on, on Minnesota wrestling or on the AWA. Let me clarify that. And sometimes I got no answers from the publishers and that meant that's the answer. They're not interested. And I got a few, now nah, we're not interested or we don't think that would be, you know. But I, I presented it to the History Center and they they jumped on it. Um, and as we did the book, I wanted the title of the book to be Four Lights and a Ring. And my my idea with that title was I came from an era when we went to the arena for the night's matches, we were in a dark auditorium arena with a ring in the center and four or five lights above the ring, the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those are in the days before we had the entrance music and the, and all that stuff and the fireworks like they do today. But when you heard a wrestler coming down the aisle, the bad guys would usually enter the ring first for a match. But they'd come from a dark back of the auditorium from the locker room. And you you wouldn't see them if you were sitting around the ringside area. But you'd hear the crowd getting louder and louder as they're throwing out the booze for whoever it was that was coming, you know, and they'd get louder. And as that wrestler approached the ring, then, of course, the whole auditorium is booing. And then it would reverse when from the other side of the arena. And it was unique in those days because they kept kayfabe alive by having the bad guys come from one corner one area mm -hmm. of the building and the good guys come from the other the reality was a lot of times they were in the same area locker rooms but it was the way they just entered the ring to come in because logic had it that if they didn't like each other well they couldn't come out of the same locker room so we'd hear that same rumble as the crowd heard the good guy whoever it was the baby face by the time he got to the ring, the place was erupting with, you know, the, the, the cheers. And that four lights in the ring, um, it was the wrestlers on their stage in the ring. So that's the title I wanted. And I had explained that to the History Center. And I said, you know, the thing was, is any real, true, old school fan, my age and, and older, and, and I was, I'll admit, I was... 13 years younger than I am right now when, when this concept came about for the book. So um, I said, they'll understand what that title means, mm -hmm. but the history center being a Minnesota historical society, they wanted Minnesota in the name. And they, at the last minute, as we were getting ready to publish my, my editor said, you know, we're going to have to Joe do something with that title. And boy, I, I protested. I, and, and she told me, she says, here's the deal. Minnesota is what's going to sell the book. And so I went with them and 
I'd be the first one to tell somebody that uh, I was wrong if I am, and I was. Uh, here we are all these years later, and the book is still. I was at a Barnes & Noble. Uh, what's today? We're taping this on a Wednesday. It was on Monday. I was at a Barnes & Noble, and they're on the shelf, two copies of my Minnesota's Golden Age of Wrestling. And it's still there. Uh, and usually what I've done over the years is when I do see copies in the bookstores, I usually go to the to the counter and ask who's ever the manager, whoever it is. I say, you know, if you'd like me to sign the books, I will. Because they like to put those little autograph stickers on, on books. Mm -hmm. um, they told me in the very beginning, they said, you know, people like to have the autograph in the book. So, okay, proves I know how to write my name, but I'm okay with it. And I put them on there. And what's good about that is when I go back to a Barnes and Noble and I'll see another book or two books or three books on the shelf and they don't have that sticker, well, then I know they've got new supply and the other one's sold. So it's kind of been a, a good uh, marking point for me too. But that's how the name came about and it, it's worked. Well, obviously, and we know everything on this interweb is true. <laughs> but sure. Am I on the internet? Sure. You, you used wrestling as a way to escape the troubles in your life at the time as a child. So what got you hooked? And if you don't mind talking about it, but if, if you want to avoid it, we can. What were you trying to avoid as a child? Well, I, I have talked about this at different times, and, and I'm certainly not, uh, I'm not a, afraid to talk about it. I, I think here's the thing. I'm going to tell people here, I'm 72 years old. And, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, you'd hear the old guy at the porch talking, you know, back when I was a kid, you know, this, that, whatever happened. And, you know, and you look at him and go, oh, yeah, you know, sure. Uh, you're bullshit. Yeah. But, but I have to tell you, you know, I'm 72 years old and I'm still learning. And that's the important thing. I honestly believe that if I wake up in the morning and I can't learn something new, you know, maybe, maybe I'm getting close to the end and I never want that. But the deal with um, uh, finding wrestling, as I look at the world today, and this is not going to get political, it's just an observation. The world that I graduated from high school in, in 1970, and for you folks that don't do the math real quick, that's 53 years ago. Um, there are times when I look back and I say, you know, if someone would have told me when I was 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, that the things that are going on in our world today, that the things we're seeing and we're witnessing, whether it, you know, just the division amongst people and all the discord and everything, I have to honestly tell you, I wouldn't have believed them. The world has changed so much. In the views, the uh, opinions, and and one of the things I, I attribute it to, of course, is the advent of the social media. I think it's given every single person out there a platform. Everybody can talk now. Everybody can voice an opinion or have a thought or share something. And that's good. But it has also caused so much strife and so much uh, untruths and so much division and so many pointing fingers. And so to answer your question about wrestling, when I look at the world as I see it today, I see young kids in school. I look at the schools, and we're talking grade schools, kindergarten on up. They have to have police officers in the schools today. They have to have the schools locked to let no one come in. I can tell you right now that was different from my year when I went to grade school. We went to grade school and it was a safe place to be. And we never had to worry about some kid coming into the classroom carrying a gun. Well, we didn't have backpacks in those days, but, you know, kids came to school with their little briefcases or notebooks and big coats and pockets. And we never, in all the years I went to school, we never, and we never heard stories about a, a fourth grader, a fifth grader, a seventh grader bringing a gun into school. Uh, today, it's almost a daily topic in whatever town you want to go into it. We have to have police officers in the school because the kids are getting beat up. The kids are bullied. And, and kids have always been bullied. 
Hey, I'll tell you what, I got bullied at school when I was a kid. I got made fun of because, believe it or not, back in my day, four eyes. Kids made fun of you because you wore glasses. Um, I got made fun of because in my days of going to elementary school, I didn't have a mother. My parents, now this is where you kind of get a little bit of the story, but my parents had gotten divorced after just a horrific nine years of marriage. They, they, they should have never stayed together as long as they did. They got divorced when I was eight years old. And I was the oldest of, at the time, six kids. There was a lot of infidelity in the marriage. There were a couple of kids that weren't my dad's. You can figure where all this goes and you're trying to keep a marriage together. Uh, long story short, my mother wasn't a nice person. Now, I say that, and my mother passed away uh, in 20, 2009. She passed away alone. Nobody knew she died. And she had ended up having eight kids total, and none of them were there. None of them knew that she died, and myself included. Um, but she gave up us. She gave us all up when I was eight years old. And my two sisters and a brother and I all went into separate foster homes. We didn't. We weren't in the same home. My dad didn't have a house or an apartment or anything that we could go to, so he put us in foster homes. And uh, for the next uh, three years. I was in three different foster homes. My sisters, the same thing, my brother. And uh, it was a very different growing up. I was in homes that I didn't, I didn't feel I belonged into. I wasn't a part of their family. I had some of the kids in the families that made fun of me because I was the outsider. I was in their home. I don't belong there. It wasn't that the people, that the parents weren't bad. They, they just, it didn't work out. And so that's where the wrestling came in from. Um, it was something that I needed. I was following it from the time I was about uh, eight years old. And I clutched onto it. it. If I had a magazine or I, my dad, God bless him, would have taken me to a wrestling card, I'd save the program. And I just started saving this stuff. And, you know, as a little kid, you can look at it a hundred times. So all of that was really important. And when I look at that today, I think that what you have to realize is that if we had more hobbies available to kids, I think they have to find something instead of finding a gang to get into or instead of finding, you know, if they're not being socially accepted or they're coming from broken homes. And ironically, I think today we have more broken homes than we ever did because today we have families with, uh, no fathers, several fathers, don't know who the father is, sometimes different mothers, um, sometimes, you know, not even with the parents. Um, the kids don't have the, the, the social gathering with the family like they used to. So, you know, I think more than ever, we need to have, we need to have ways to get kids involved in activities, hobbies, my simple advice to, to young kids is I say, you know, you have to find something that defines you as a child, whether it be a lot of different toys that you want to collect, whether it be stamps, birds, you know, you, you love to go fishing, do a lot of fishing, whether you, whatever you want to collect, you like cars, you want to read comic books, whatever it was, um, you need something to divert you from getting involved with the bad element out there. And I'm not saying that would be the perfect answer to the woes of the world today. But when I look at the. Uh, it would help. Some. At, yeah, exactly. And when I look at the kids. Um, school today is not a safe haven. And the kids are in trouble by the time they're 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. We certainly have a lot more guns available to kids today. We have a lot more murders. I live in Minneapolis, or I live in the Twin Cities. I'm in a suburb of St. Paul, an eastern suburb. And in St. Paul and Minneapolis, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that every morning, and yes, I still turn on a radio, kids, if you remember what that is, because people don't listen to the radio anymore. But I do turn on our, our local station, and I can tell you every morning, no exaggeration, there was a murder or two in Minneapolis. There was a murder in St. Paul. And, and some of the suburbs. And you go, it never was this way. Yeah, you had a murder. 
Yeah, you had stuff in the old days. I'm not saying that it was perfect, but it certainly is more dangerous. Um, we know that, uh, you know, all the drugs and everything are accessible better today. And, and the kids have access to so much more evil information if they want it. Um, they're growing up faster at a younger age. And when they're in grade school, they're there. And, and again, I, like I said, I don't want this to be a political thing, but when they're in grade school, they're deciding that they don't want to be a boy. They want to be a girl or they're identifying. Oh my word. It, it's just totally, it's totally confusing, you know? And by the time we get to an adulthood, um, the world's a mess. So I got involved with wrestling and I was very fortunate. Well, because uh, go ahead. Sorry. Go, no, go. I want uh, your, this is your show. So. Well, the two things before we get off the serious uh, soapbox. And, <laughs> yeah. But uh, the gun thing, as far as schools and stuff are concerned, that started changing when I was in high school. I'm 39. Okay. And that would have been Columbine, the first. Yeah, oh, yeah. Eighth yeah. or ninth. I, I would have been like eighth grade freshman yeah. when that happened. And that and it's just been like a downward turn from there where things changed. And yeah. I don't know. Do you have kids of your own? I have two growing daughters. Uh, one is uh, a school teacher. She's a kindergarten teacher. And the other one, uh, she she's a dancer. She it, Ballet, she teaches it, dances it, and then is in all kinds of productions of ballet. So, But my point being that when you sent your daughters to school, or even early on when me and my younger sister went to school, it was because I'm in a small town near Philly and yeah. but on the Jersey side, but it was parents could send their kids to school and you didn't have to be worried is the point. point that exactly. was the one place you could send your kids and right. You didn't have to work, but obviously that, like I said, during my time period, especially that started changing. But when you were telling your story, with your parents and stuff obviously you talked about your mother but would you say you came full circle with your father at least for whatever the stuff that was going on within the family structure or lack thereof oh yeah definitely um the family structure you know I guess the point I like to make is that when I was not you got to remember when I was eight years old that's 1959 here we are all these years removed. And uh, when I was eight years old, it was, it was still unusual to hear people that got divorced. It wasn't as just common as it is today. I mean, we all know people that are divorced and some are married many times, you know, it, it's a different, it's different. Yeah. And I think of my three sons and the, you know, leave it to be yeah. and stuff, you know, yeah. that type of yeah. yeah. But the thing was, is that um, it was a little bit out of the ordinary when the father, back in my day, when the father would get the children. It was usually the mother when a divorce situation took place. You know, dad would be the one to leave and uh, the mother would have the kids and dad would have to pay support and alimony and, you know, you name it. Uh, my situation was a little bit different. Uh, the courts actually ordered that my mother not have us because we, and that's a whole nother story we could go down, another alley we could go down into. Um, the mistreatment that we had uh, as far as, um, uh, for lack of a better word, just the serious spankings and punishments and, and uh, you know, not feeding us. I mean, it, it was just not a bad, it was just a bad situation. And my dad had to, uh, has by court order take us out of there or both parents would have lost the kids. But as I said, uh, he was not in a position to bring us together for three years after that happened. And that's where each of us had to endure some different. So, you know, I had sisters that I, we grew up together in different houses mm -hmm. and, we, and, and you don't, you don't, you, and, and that's even sadder too, because you don't form the bonds uh, yeah, family is is bonded together because they are together. And I, I, with my brothers and sisters, I don't think I've ever had any 
what I would call really serious bonds. We, we're all different. We all experience different things in different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, but the, as far as my dad, oh yeah. My dad was a, my dad was a great, great guy. And he, uh, his one fault was, is that he ignored things. If he didn't see it happening, he was better off because he didn't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so when I grew up, uh, after he finally got us together in 1963, 60 years ago, I was 12 years old. I became the babysitter in the house for the other three. My dad worked two jobs, which pretty much means he was gone all the time. We were on our own. Uh, he never, never got involved with our schoolwork, never attended any of our school things. So obviously we didn't have a mother that did either. And, and, uh, so we grew up in a different environment. So to answer your question, um, I'm just going to say I fared better than my brothers and sisters did in that I learned that I don't want to be the way that my parents were. And that's not saying I'm perfect. No. But, but lesson learned for you. I, for... I, I wanted, I look at it as reverse role models. They were, they were role models to me in a reverse way. I wanted to not emulate them. And uh, so the relationship with the mother never happened. When I did have a relationship with her, it was extremely difficult I, uh, through the years. And, uh, but again, I will tell you this, and I've made this comment to people that uh, I had found out a year after she passed away and it appears she was pretty sick. Um, I would have went to her if she'd have called me. And I think that's probably more than she deserved, but I would have because I've, I've forgiven her. I have no malice to her. She, I, I, I try to analyze what she was going through as a person when she was having kids. Um, not that I condone it or, or say that it's right, but she, she had a lot of issues and she wasn't able to deal with them. She had eight kids in 11 years. You do the math. She was pregnant mm -hmm. all the time. It takes nine months to make a baby. So you're pregnant, have a kid, get pregnant, have a kid, you know. And and she was 29 years old when, when she got divorced. And, and she just wasn't, she wasn't equipped to do all what she was doing. Doesn't make it right. But uh, if I carried around a grudge, um, I, I'd be in trouble today. And I'd be feeling sorry for myself and probably not have any success. So... I learned that you gotta you gotta forgive, you gotta try to understand, and it to the day she died, I said I loved her, and we'll leave it at that. My dad, um, good guy, he he did what he could, the best he could. He kept a roof over our head. I wouldn't call it a home because a home is where you have memories and lots of things you do together, and 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 that we didn't have that, but uh, he was. Uh, he kept a roof over our head. We had food on the table. And so uh, he passed away at an early age, 55 years old. And that's 42 years ago now. So uh, he was only 55. And but, uh, we can have these type of serious conversations all day long over a beer. And, you know, I mean, we could, we like you said, we can do such a deep dive on all that. But let's dive into the business a little bit, shall we? Sure, sure. And, and and that's the very thing, diving in to the business, to the wrestling. That's what kept my feet grounded. Whenever, so, and so. and ahead, I just sorry. want to say this. I have, I have said this emphatically. People don't understand. I can go down the hallway and I have a room in my house that's ceiling to floor, wall to wall, wrestling. On the walls, posters, programs, pictures, file cabinets, collection of magazines, programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all my results that I do and everything. And, and, and what that room is, is it's a place of solitude. It's, it's a place where, where when the world around me is on my shoulders and it's been tough through my years, I can go in that room and I can be in there a half hour, an hour, and I come out and the world's in sync. So that's been my drug. I tell people that is a drug and it's safe. I don't have to put anything in my arm. I don't have to 
try to pop something to get a better feeling. And that's why I say, if you got a hobby, you know, it sounds like we're doing a, a self-help program here, but, but this, this is, this is the way I see it. Um, I think you gotta, I think you gotta stay focused on what makes you happy and have a, have a place to go when you need to get away. And for me, it's wrestling. I also liked comic books as a kid, Batman, Superman. And I quit buying them when it, when the early seventies, but I have never stopped loving those comic books. And I have went back and I bought old issues before all the issues that I collected as a kid. I, I kept them. So I'm still a Batman and Superman fan and hardcover books and anything I can find on them. I don't follow the modern version of them as I don't the modern wrestling. But I loved old cars as a kid, and I still love old cars, and I collect models. So in essence, I'm still enjoying what I had as a kid. And that's what I tell people. My youngest granddaughter, who's going to graduate this coming, this coming year, she said to me years ago, she said, I don't, Grandpa, I don't want to grow up. And I, I teased her. I said, well, you know what? You don't ever need to hang on to the things you enjoy, the fun things that you do in life and, and always hang on to those things that were important to you. I can speak because of my wrestling, my cars, my, my comics. I'm a kid, but yet I spent all my years working in a bank, helping people with financial situations and loans and, and, I want to say I I uh, have a good family. I raised two girls with my my wife. We're going to be married in uh, just a just a tad over a month. We're going to be married fifty years. Marshall to that. January, January of uh, twenty four coming around here, and she's kept me grounded. She's kept real for me because she came from a family totally perfect from what I endured. So we were opposites, but she's been my, she's been my rock. And the thing is, uh, I think that's what, what we need to do in life. So now wrestling, that's what we want to talk about kids. Yes. So obviously, as I told you, and we're going to definitely talk AWA and all that fun stuff, but we're going to talk, the business in general too because <laughs> a lot has stayed the same but a lot is different too with the business but when did you obviously you were a fan as a kid started watching on tv all that fun stuff we kind of just touched on that on the personal side but when did you start getting heavily involved with the business from a different aspect well, I, I really was uh, right from the beginning because I wanted to, uh, from the time I was about 12, I came up with the idea that I could, uh, you know, it's so easy today because we have instantaneous knowledge in our world today. You know, there's no secret. If something happens wherever it is, we know it right now. And in our era, in the, in the wrestling era, you know, you didn't know what happened in the town across the river from you. You didn't know about the other territories. You didn't know about the other wrestlers. So we would hear, I, I, I just decided I wanted to start knowing what was going on in a different territory or something. And that started because I would buy the wrestling magazines. I'd go to the drugstore. I'd get a wrestling review magazine. And, you know, I'd, I'd read about, uh, and I'm just going to throw the name up. I read about Bruno San Martino or Gorilla Monsoon, or or some other wrestler, Nick Kozak, or whoever it was. You go, wow, that guy looks cool, you know, and he's wrestling in Texas, or they're wrestling in New York, you know. And so I got the idea. I thought, you know, it'd be really be fun if I could know more about these. So I did start a little bit of a network. They used to have a pen pal section. This is how it originally started. It's really uh, low key. And most of the magazines had a pen pal section where they'd have fans just say, I'd like to trade programs, or I'd like to, you know, get to get to know this person in a different city or whatever. And I actually wrote to a few of them. And sometimes somebody write back to you. And 
what I wanted to do is if they attended wrestling in their town, I wanted to get a copy of their program, their wrestling program that they bought at the wrestling matches. And I, in turn, would send them a copy of my program from. So I ended up buying when I go to the matches and, you know, God bless my dad because he wasn't a wrestling fan, but he took me to a lot of the wrestling matches and the wrestling cards, <laughs> excuse me. And so I would start buying 10, 15 programs and I'd be sending one to Tampa and one to Dallas and one to San Francisco and St. Louis and I'd get their programs. So at a very early age, when I'm 13, 14, 15 years old, I, I knew that, well, you know, if, if my promoter here is telling me that this wrestler is injured and he can't wrestle, but I got a program the other day that he's main eventing in Dallas, well, I, you know, hey, wait a minute, something's not kosher here. But the thing was, is that they presented it as fake, or I mean, as real. The, the, the promoters presented it as real. We're real. This is real matches. And uh, when someone is hurt, we believe them. So I started putting two and two together before you know it. I knew that that obviously was worked. There were stories being told that weren't uh, really what happened. But I never went to school and told the kids anything that I knew. Um, it was the old story back then. If somebody didn't watch wrestling or they didn't, you know, if they did think it was fake, They'd pick on you. You know, that stuff's fake, don't you, Shire? How can you watch that stuff? You know, well, okay, I'm not going to talk to you about it because we have a difference of opinion. So it, when I got to 16, I got my driver's license, and that was the key because now I could go to – we had a lot of spot shows around. Do you know what a spot show is? Oh, of so, course, and this was would be – to explain the, to people here in this, it would be, say, and back in that time period, too, you might do a show for, say, the Elks Lodge or yeah. the local soccer team or what, where they'd raise yep. funds on an off day. And AWA had a lot more of those off days. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing. You'd have your TV matches, you know, your St. Sure. Paul, Minneapolis, and you Chicago or later on Vegas and stuff. But they we'd have these spot shows where they would be part fundraiser and all that fun stuff. So yeah. go ahead. That's exactly it. And you know the thing that's kind of interesting is that if you wanted to compare it to today, you know, we realize that the big dog, the WWE and and to a lesser extent uh, and still hanging in there is AEW, I believe. But if you look at these small indie cards that are around your city, um they're held in gymnasiums or in, uh, you know, small clubs. Natural armories. And exactly. They're actually what a spot show used to be, where it's in a smaller venue. And But as far as the AWA goes, which was my home territory, um, I'd, get, I'd get a chance because I had my driver's license. You know, it was okay to drive down to uh, Hastings, Minnesota, which was, you know, 20 miles from where I live, and see a card at a gymnasium or, or whatever. That's what I started doing. And the more I saw, the more I wanted to do. Um, eventually, it was during the summer months, it wasn't unusual for me when I was still going to school to, you know, be able to drive to Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, that, that's not across the street. No. But you do it. I'd do it. And I had a friend that used to do it with me. And, uh, it just got to the point where the more places I went, the more places I wanted to go. So that was my involvement with it is, is I started knowing what was going on because I was attending different areas wrestling and my break, this is the break. It came when I was spotted and some of the folks that have heard me talk about this thing, they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. Marty O'Neill, who was our local wrestling host, all-star wrestling TV host, and he was the ring announcer. He was a legend in Minnesota. He was a broadcaster. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, did sports for years, was a sports guy himself. He played baseball as a kid. But anyway, Marty was our announcer. And uh, 
the more I started going through the St. Paul and Minneapolis wrestling cards, I'd have my, on my lap, I'd have an envelope. And in those days, I had a clear envelope and I'd put my programs in. And Marty, you know, as you see him all the time, he'd walk by me as he's going to the ring and he'd say, hey, young man, how you doing? You know, and that's all it was for a long time. And uh, one night he come over to me during the intermission or whatever it was. And he said, I got a question for you. He says, I notice you always pack a bunch of programs in your package. You know, what, what, why do you buy so many? And I told him. And he says, oh, I, I, I didn't realize somebody would do that. And, and the typical fan would have a program. And by the end of the evening, it was on the floor when they left the building, wrinkled up, spilled Coke on it or popcorn all over it or their beer. They used to sell beer. Um, and, and it was left behind it. Here I am, one of these weirdos that's, you know, protecting them. So Marty thought that was kind of interesting. And he asked me, he said he was going down. He said he was driving to a town called Ortonville. And I didn't know it at the, I didn't even know what Ortonville was at this time. It was, it's a Southern small town in Southern Minnesota. He was driving down there for a spot show. And he said, you know, if you, if you're interested, I could always use the company driving. I'd, You'd like to ride along. Well, you know, I think at the time I probably just about filled my pants. I mean, this is Marty O'Neill talking to me. You know, he was a god. Um, and I was uh, I was 16 at the time. It was over the summer. And so, yeah, I, I went with Marty and I went with him quite a few times to some small shows. Got to know him. He never admitted to me that wrestling wasn't, wasn't uh, as they say, not real. But he never denied it either. And we could have an intelligent conversation. And one that really comes to mind that I remember is we had just received, this was in 1967, and we had the new mask guy in town. Nobody knew where he was from. You know, they didn't know how much he weighed. He was from parts unknown, Dr. X. And uh, I personally had figured out, and I, I could show you the weird way I took a piece of paper and I had a picture of the destroyer with a mask and I colored it in and put the trunks and the tunic on it with a black magic marker. This is a dumb kid. It's, you know, 16 years old. And I figured out that Dr. X is the destroyer. I was sure of it. And I noticed that the destroyer wasn't wrestling anywhere at that time. Now this is my own little observation of my programs. So I'm saying to Marty on one trip, I said, you know, I think it's funny how some of the people, don't recognize who Dr. X is. And Marty only said something to the effect of, well, you know, people just don't sit down and put two and two together. He never, he never confirmed or denied my, my speculation, but ironically the same Dr. X, uh, as a couple of years went by at my high school, they had put together a fundraiser and they asked me because they knew I was a wrestling fan to go to the wrestling office in Minneapolis and try to arrange with one of, they were putting on a, a fundraiser for the uh, uh, police reserve in the town I lived in. And they wanted me to go along with one of the officers and get a card arranged. So I did, ended up with Dr. X on my card and I got to sit with him in the locker room. That's a whole nother story about how that card went, but I got to know Dr. X and he and I became friends and I was, I consider him my best friend in wrestling up until the day he died in 2019 when I got the news that he passed away. So, Well, two things there I want to bring up. First being, when would you say that light bulb went off for you as far as the business? But also, with that, when you were riding with Marty O'Neill there, was that the first time you were taken into the locker room and they said, hey, he's okay? Talking about you. Actually, actually the riding with Marty was the start of it. Um, it got, you know, one of the things about kayfabe was the wrestlers were very protective of the business and they weren't going to get close to the fans because <clears throat> they would have just, you know, defied their character or whatever they were doing. So to be a kid and to be a younger person and have them accept you was very difficult. What had happened was, is that through Marty, I met Red Bastine, who was one of the wrestlers that was working in the AWA at the time. And Red was from Minneapolis. 
was. And what it was is it was that constant exposure and Marty knowing that I wasn't going to expose the business. There were times when I knew what was going to happen in the match that was going to take place. And I wouldn't, I would never tell anybody. And I did. And they do that. So Red Bastine was actually the first guy. And this was in July of 1969. So it had been a couple of years. But I was with Red at the Minneapolis Auditorium talking with him. And he had to go into the locker room. And he just said to me, come on in here with me. Come on in. And, you know, I was kind of in awe. I was, I, I got to admit, I had butterflies. I went into the locker room. I, he pushed the door open. And my first observation was, is that as soon as that door opened and they saw me, and I will tell you, the heels and the, and the baby faces were all in the same locker room. The interesting thing about the auditorium was, is let's use this as a hallway from here to here. They had a door on this side at this end of the hallway. And then on the other end of the hallway, they had a door over here. Well, the bad guys would go in one door. The good guys would go in the other coming down from the two sides of the, the building. Outside that hallway in the arena, the auditorium, well, it looks like there's two separate entrances to something, but there was no divider in between. So I walked in the room, long story short, and they saw me and immediately, I, it hit me right away. It's like they were all talking and jabbering and laughing. And as soon as they saw me, you could have heard that pin drop. They, they silenced up. And Red, he said, he put, my, his, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, the boy's okay. Don't, don't worry. The boy's okay. And then they started their chambering. And that was the first time. So after that, I got to know various wrestlers. And it, it was just, I, I felt blessed because I was, they accepted. They never told me. They never broke the secrets or anything. I, I'm not going to say I was in the know. But I, I knew what was going on because I got all the programs. And and uh, it, it was just a great experience. And the wrestlers accepted me. So, you know, the guys like Red Bastine and Dr. X and Larry Henning, who became a friend, and Ramon Torres, and uh, the Big K, Stan Crusher Kowalski. Oh, my God. Well, he hated that name, Big K. But Stan Crusher Kowalski. Uh, these were guys that, uh, j just some of them that became life long friends and i had the honor of having them in my house at different times and uh i got to do stories then i started working with the wrestling news magazine i wanted to be a journalist when i was in high school i wanted i wanted to i thought journalism was the place to go and i wanted to be a broadcaster and so those were two things that i but i still lived in an era where graduate you know in 1970 i brought that up earlier you didn't have to, in those days, you didn't have to automatically go off to college. It was still not an era where everybody graduates, got to go to college. It was still good. You got your high school and you go to college to be a teacher, a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist or something like that. But most people just went out and got a job. I took journalism classes at a local, at a, one of our local uh, junior colleges. And uh, then I went to broadcasting school and I graduated. Did I, I, I never officially went into radio. I wanted to, but I never did. It just wasn't financially feasible. But I've done a million things with announcing and, and even these things like podcasts. I've done radio shows. I've, you know, it's always been around wrestling. I've done ring announcing. So I, I guess I've used the talents and all the wrestling magazines. That was the other thing where I got to know the wrestlers because they would trust me because I was writing a story about them or I was, or I was uh, asking for information. I was doing an interview. And they would tell me what they wanted to put in the story, but, you know, at least they were talking to you and they trusted. Me. And so um, I think that's where it all came about. It was, it was very difficult. I mean, it wasn't until I got into my uh, earlier twenties before I could say that automatically that George was okay. Uh, it was a tough nut to crack, but all the guys that I knew after that, uh, you know, when Nick Bockwinkle used to call me on the phone, we just we just had the pass or just we're coming up on the, the date of his birthday here on uh, December 6th. But we just had the day of his passing here last week and uh, back in 2015. It's hard to believe that's nine years already. But he um, he used he was one that he'd call me frequently over the over the decades. 
just get a call out of the blue. Hey, he'd go, Georgie, Nicholas Bach here. And we'd talk. He'd have a question. We'd talk about wrestling. We'd talk about other things. I met, I used to meet him once on a great moon for lunch. And, uh, you know, so they, they got to be friends. And that was something that kept me grounded, too. You know, I, I wanted to have their respect. And I wasn't going to do anything to detract from it. Um, Dr. X. He's a guy that, uh, you know, I knew he was Dick Byer and I knew he was the destroyer and I never told anybody. I mean, later on, it became common knowledge, but um, I never told anybody. I wouldn't. You could have put a gun to my head. I wouldn't have told you. I'd have made something up. I kept kayfabe. And that's what what they respected. They respected you for respecting what they did. Right. Right. And, and you know, respecting when I, the craft. And, and, and when I when I realized you know, after I did all my writing and I started getting ready to do the book and everything, um, I, I wanted to dispel because already by the time I'm doing the book, Cafe was gone. You know, Vince McMahon back in 1989 went public, said it's entertainment. The reality was it's always been entertainment for since 1900 and before. It's always been entertainment. But um, I wanted to explain it differently. And I did this in my book. I asked the question, I said, professional wrestling, is it real? Is it fake? Or is it something else? And that's the that's the key. It is something else. It's a mixture of multiple elements. It is it is a theatrical athletic contest that is that can't be matched anywhere with anything. And if you can understand that, you know, I, I remember the guys, how they would protect it. I also said in my book, Eddie Sharkey, who was a wrestler uh, back in the 60s, he was a, he started in the carnivals. And Eddie is still with us, and he's he's 80-something years old, and he's a good guy, you know. But he Character, made the from what I've heard. <laughs> oh, he is. He, 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 likes to, he likes pranks. But Eddie made the comment, and I quoted it in my book. Eddie said, we were programmed when we got into the business that we never break kayfabe, that we don't tell anyone that wrestling, that it's predetermined, that the results are predetermined. Our, our goal is, our, our objective is to always try to make it as real as we can. And he put in, and I put this in my book, he said, my parents, oh, this is Eddie's parents now. He says, my parents died and went to their grave believing that what I did for a living was real. That's really carrying it far. But a lot of these guys, yeah, they did. They, they had to live uh, the realism to the point where sometimes their own families didn't know. And I and, think that's remarkable. And with that being said, and obviously, like you said, the horses left the ball and Vince made a announcement in 89 for the taxes in Jersey and that story has been told but as far as the business is concerned from my perspective whether we're talking 1965 or 2023 where we're sitting mm -hmm. the thing that I always point out whether it's predetermined or not you cannot fake or you can't fix gravity and what they do to their bodies is they, you know, I mean, yes, it's a theatrical athletic show and all, but you cannot, you have to respect what they do to oh, themselves absolutely. physically. Absolutely. You know, and when I, and I don't watch today's product and I admit that up front every once in a while, I just check in on it, but I, I don't follow it, but I will tell you this. Uh, the, the guys today, the same as in my era, what they do during the course of any match they're in. Um, I, I guess I'm surprised there aren't more injuries, real injuries. But you, you have to realize that when, when, when the term fake got tossed out, um, Nick Bockwinkle, he would say to me, you know, when somebody would ask him, you know, that stuff's fake, isn't it, Nick, or whatever. And Nick would say, well, I'll tell you what, let me pick you up off the floor over my head and throw you to the floor 
And then when you land on the floor, tell me it's fake. Well, he's making a good point. The reality was, though, they did that in the ring night after night after night after night. They had to learn how to fall, how to take that that jar through their system. And Nick told me, he said, you know, we we never and this is after he did, you know, we talked about openly about prearranged and everything. And Nick says, you know, I have to tell you that every time you get slammed, it's not that it doesn't hurt. It's that we learned how to accept Your condition. The, the condition to do it. We knew it was coming. And you have to remember, too, if, if you looked at the cover of my book, I have here, I'll show you. I have a placemat. This is this is the I have a mouse mat, but this is the cover of my book. Now, do you see that that's Moose Evans, who's got the crush or hoisted over his head in this picture? Now, I, I chose this picture on purpose, and this will come with our conversation. First of all, you can see where Moose's hand up here, he's got Crusher cradled well. He's got him cradled well over here. When Crusher is on the ground and he picks him up, obviously Crusher is going to work with him and be, you know, you, light, be light. Go with him when he lifts up. You know, if yeah. I tried to lift you, if I tried to lift you and you just stood there, I'm not going to lift you. But if you were to help me, hoist yourself up. So you see what he's doing. So Crusher's yeah. up in the air. And if you could see his leg fully, Crusher's actually flinging himself. So it's all a fluid motion. So when you mm -hmm. see that action in the ring, picking him up over his head, tossing him to the mat, slamming him to the mat, but they worked together. And they made that work and they protected each other. And yep. Nick said, that was the, the most beautiful thing about what we did in the ring. He said, we had to go in there and protect one another because I don't want to really hurt this guy because I got to wrestle him again tomorrow night. If, we, if I hurt him, there goes my payday. They, they, they were a, a family. I always just, I described it later on, like in the Willie Nelson song, uh, on the road again, if you've heard that song. Of course. And Willie says in the song, he says, like a band of gypsies going down the highway. Well, that's what the wrestlers were. Yep. They, they would laugh how in, in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, they didn't have air travel as uh, akin to them as they do today. They would get in a car and they laugh. They say, we'd get in this, somebody owned a big Oldsmobile 98. And we'd pack six guys in there and we'd all chip in for gas. And we'd drive 600 miles to the town. Case of and beer and a whole bit. Yeah. A case of beer and the whole thing. And he says, you know, then and we'd wrestle. And Nick's famous line. Because one time I was talking to him. You know, we know that in the, in the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of the younger wrestlers that have succumbed to early deaths in their 30s and 40s whether it be steroid abuse, drug abuse, cocaine, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's been there and it's part of it. But Nick made the comment to me. He said, you know, what's different about the business today? Now, this was back, let's go 15 or 20 years ago. Nick says, what's different about the business today is that the guys are making more money, better money. They're flying here, flying there. And they get into the drugs, they get into the steroids, got to have the bigger, better, biggest body. He says, in my era, he said, we used to get in the car, drive that two, 300 miles to the town, wrestle. And his key word was hope we got paid because there were unscrupulous promoters and I can't pay you what I promised you. And oh, I didn't get you. Know, shocker. <laughs> yeah. So, so Nick said, we'd hope we got paid. Then we'd go back to the hotel. He said, we'd stop and get a case of beer and some bread and bologna for our bologna sandwiches. Have a, have a couple hours of fun, go to sleep, get up the next morning, drive 300 miles and do the same thing over again. And that was fact. That's what those guys did. Now, the key thing about the injuries is you can't do what they're doing every single night of the week. And most of these guys back in that era, oh, man, they wrestled four, five, six, sometimes seven nights a week. And the double and shots on some days, too. Exactly. And so you can't do that every night and not have a mishap or a miscue in the ring. 
there were guys that would break fingers, break a wrist, crack an elbow, uh, put a knee out. They'd go in, they'd have to bandage up as best they could, pop some aspirins and, and go in the ring and wrestle. They didn't have insurance. A lot of them couldn't get insurance. Promoters didn't take care of them for insurance. So they were on their own. So the key thing was, is when they were really hurt, they wrestled. It was the fake injuries that we heard about. You know, uh, Nick Bockwinkle put Billy Robinson out of action fans and, you know, whatever the injury is. But it was the real injuries we never heard about. And then when you go, and I had the opportunity, you know, for the number, number, number of years that I attended Cauliflower Alley Club. And uh, that was one of my great honors, too, because I got to be on the executive board for a number of years. And I was brought on the board. I'm just going to point this out to show you the, the trust. I was brought on the board by Dr. X, Dick Meyer, Nick Bockwinkle, and Red Bastine. And they said, you have to be on the board. I was an outsider. I'm telling you right now. I was in the room with Killer Kowalski. Penny Banner, Tom Drake, Bockwinkle, all these wrestlers, and here's plain old me. But here is the deal. When you're at Cauliflower Alley and you're seeing these guys that in their they're now in their 70s and their 80s, and they can barely walk. Their ankles are fused, their knees are broken. They, they've had shoulder replacements, hip replacements. Now everybody, you know, average guys can get a hip replacement or a knee replacement. But we're talking about guys that have had them both replaced and probably more than once. Ankles are fused because they they're so messed up. Um, the the broken shoulders, the broken elbows, and you see them when they're all broken down. And my favorite line was Jim Brunzel, who's a known high flyer, jumping Love the Jim guy. Brunzel. Yeah, jumping Jim Brunzel. He was a high. He was a high. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, oh goodness, it's a he was game. he was a jumper in high school and college. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. know Jim quite well. Okay, Jim Brunzel, night after night in a match, he would get up in the air, six feet high, get that drop kick to the chin of his opponent, and then he would fall to the mat. That's you know the action. Come up, drop kick, come down to the mat. Jim has to come one of out. the best drop kicks in the business, by the way. Bingo. But Jim Brunzel in 2010, he had just gotten soldier, uh, shoulder surgery. And, and I was talking with him. I said, how did you end up having to have soldier, shoulder, soldier, shoulder surgery? He looked at me and I, I'm going to do exactly what he did. He says, well, you remember all those fake drop kicks that I gave? He says, okay. every night I was coming down on the mat, but he has to hit his shoulder on the mat when he comes down. Now, he wrestled for 20 years. Every night, at least one drop kick, if not more in a match, on his shoulder, he needed to have his shoulder replaced. Yeah, it's going to do that's, its damage. And he says, that's the fake That's the fake part of the business. It was... It, so I think when you when you look at the wrestlers, they they really took it seriously, and I admire the guys even today. Oh my goodness, what they do! Uh, I I actually pray for them because some of them are some of the things they do today are even more horrific than what my era did. When you'd have a guy flipping and flopping and flying around the ring and falling to the floor and coming off the top rope, and you know, um, and it's all about working with your opponent. Uh, I, I remember Red Bastine told me one time, I, I asked him, I said, are there guys in the business that you really enjoy working with? If you could do every night with them, would you do it? You know what he told me? There were two guys he mentioned, like, almost instantaneously. He didn't have to think. Two guys. He said, Ray Stevens and Mad Dog Vashon. And I said, really? Because I see those two as having very contrasting styles. Red said to me, he said, no, he said, every night, if I could wrestle the dog or Ray every night, he said, I know every move Ray's going to do. And I know what, Ray, and Ray knows what I'm going to do. And he said, because we do, we know each other so well, our matches. And I will tell you, when I saw Ray Red match, it was, you, you didn't want to have popcorn spilling on it. You wanted to watch the same with the dog. Um, they respected each other so much. And, you know, the idea was Nick said, or Nick told me, he said, uh, 
or Red told me, he said, well, every night you've got to go in with the idea that you want your opponent to be protected and they in turn will protect you. So some of the greatest matches, oh my gosh, I saw, I saw Nick Bockwinkle wrestle Billy Robinson, I'll bet you at least a couple hundred times over the years. And I'm talking just singles matches now. Uh, but but I saw him wrestle in tag team matches many, many, many times too. But the singles matches, and here was what was unique about those two. Billy was tough to work with. If you ask a lot of old school wrestlers, they'll I've say, heard who, did that. You not, who did you not like being in the ring with us? Say, well, I got, had issues with Billy Robinson. You know, he liked to get cute. He liked to, he liked to show you he's better. The Billy amateur had, background. And he had that, he had that arrogance. Well, the thing with Billy. And so I said to Nick, I said, well, I've seen you guys wrestle hundreds of times. He says, here's the deal with Billy. He says, I go into the locker room before the match. He says, and I'll, I'll quote Nick. He says, well, William, what do you want to do tonight? He says, by doing that, I gave Billy respect. And Billy demanded respect. And they would have a great match. And Billy would do what he could do to make Nick look good because Nick was champion most of these matches, AWA champion. Um, he would do things to make Nick look better than he probably was. But Nick was also able to make Billy look good. And the result was for the fan, I I never got tired of Billy Robinson being a challenger to Nick Bach. And I had fans around me, they would say, Oh, here we are again. Another Robinson match. This gets so old. Well, you're, you're not really a fan. Then. You're not really catching on. You know, you're angry because Billy got another title shot. Well, why don't you enjoy what they're doing? And, and, and here's the other thing. I'd be honest to tell you that I very seldom saw the same match. They did different things. So the, the wrestlers had to respect one another. And uh, yeah, there were guys that wanted to wrestle with one another and, probably would do it every night if they could. Now, was it Billy Robinson? And we're going to jump into the AWA stuff here and as we go. But why it's on the top of my head, was it Billy Robinson that had the encounter with Larry Henning? Let me set the stage. Larry, supposedly, I never dealt with him, but only heard of the stories, that he was a family man and all that fun stuff. And the version I heard, it was Billy and a few of the boys were, you know, Talking in the locker room and such, and oh, I was with this rat. I was this that that. You know, just talking it up. And Larry kind of tried to shut it down. Going, we don't need to have that conversation. And end up poking a bully in the uh, eyes, giving the Stooges kind of deal. <laughs> was that Billy Robertson and Larry Henning? Well, I'm not saying they probably didn't have an encounter, but the only encounter I heard from the AWA standpoint was uh, Larry Hennig and Horst Hoffman and Horst Hoffman. I don't know if you're aware of him, but he was, uh, he was German. He came from Germany and he was uh, very much the same mold of a wrestler that Billy Robinson was. So he was one of those guys that you honestly did not mess with. But in the case of Larry Hennig, Larry had a sound amateur background and a sound training for the pro ranks. He came up in the Vern Gagne camp. And Larry was just naturally tough. You know, he's one of those guys that uh, a Billy Robinson or somebody, if, if you, if Billy, if for, let's put it this way, if Larry wanted to, he could probably pop him. You know, Larry, Larry was touchy about his family too when you talk about the family man it was Horst Hoffman though that uh, they had actually gotten into a scuffle and and uh Larry decked him which was unheard of because Horst was well respected for being a guy that could take anybody or pretty much anybody uh Billy Robinson had encounters though with uh, uh Peter Maivia and uh Sailor Ed White that's a name you don't normally hear but uh, depending on who you want to believe, one of those two guys took Billy Robinson's eye out. And Billy only had one eye. He had a glass eye. So I've heard the but heard Billy, that story about the eye. But Billy was Billy was just a naturally 
he, he and that's okay. And let's just go to the, let's cut to the chase here. People always say, well, why didn't Billy Robinson become a WA champion? Because Vern liked real wrestlers, which is why Nick got the title. Nick was a real wrestler who had, who used heel tactics once in a while, you know, it was the perfect blend. But in the case of Billy, the reason he didn't get the title from Vern is Vern, like a lot of wrestlers, couldn't trust Billy. Because if Vern told Billy to lose, or I want you to drop the belt, Billy didn't respect his opponent or totally care for his opponent. Billy wasn't going to lose. And Vern didn't like that type of, that type of, you can't have that type of an attitude. You can't have the employee telling you what you can or can't do. And so that's the reason. Uh, Billy would have been a good champion, but he would have been a guy that would, he would have probably destroyed a lot of people because he didn't respect them. Because a lot of guys got title shots that technically weren't really, you know, they were getting a push to get them over. They, they weren't that good. And Billy didn't like that. So he was tough. He was a tough nut. I had an, I did an interview with Billy Robinson. It was back in 2013. I, I was doing a radio program with a, a friend of mine named Glenn Broggett. And we were doing a show called Wrestling Memories. And uh, Billy Robinson was, and I think some of those are out there on the cloud somewhere, some of those episodes. But we had Billy Robinson on. I got Billy Robinson on. Um, had a very nice, if it's out there, listen to it. Had a very nice, candid talk to him. I, I had, a, I gained a new respect for him on how he, he perceived the business and how he perceived things that we're talking about tonight. Uh, Billy just demanded respect. Mm -hmm. And if, if you did, you know, if you got in, and you know, this was the thing too. Back in the day, there were always guys in the room. And you talk about a shoot. There were there were shoots in in K or wrestling. There were guys that wanted to get into the ring and work with. Just let's see how tough you are tonight for a little while, you know. And they'd shoot on one. Well, Billy was one of those guys that, quite honestly, if you wanted to shoot on him, you were probably an idiot, because he was probably <laughs> going to. You know, I mean, I'm serious. He'd probably break your your arm off and hand it to you before you knew he took it off. That that's that's really what he was capable of or breaking it to the point where, you know, your, then your arm is hanging. Um, so the shooting thing, it, it happened. Greg Gagne told me a story. And are you familiar with Greg? Yes. Okay, Greg, of course, being a second generation, he got trained by his dad and Billy Robinson. And then Greg had the, the uh, force, the, the ability to work with such great talent when he got into the business. The Ray Stevens, the Nick Bockwinkles, the Ivan Koloffs, the Wahoo McDaniels, and you know Larry Hennigs and Lars Andersons. I mean, the name, the list just gets longer and longer. So Greg had the opportunity to work with such an outstanding array of talent, but being trained by Billy. Oh, and the Iron Sheik, Cosro Vasari, he he was also in that camp with Greg, and seventy two, right? Nineteen seventy two probably one of the greatest training camps ever. <laughs> but uh, Greg told me, he said, one of the things that my dad, I was talking about Vern. He said, one of the things my dad told me up front, Greg, Vern didn't want Greg to be a wrestler. Greg wanted to be a football player. And he put his knees out, wasn't able to. And he wanted to get into wrestling and Vern tried to deter him. But eventually Vern relented. And, and Vern, or Greg told me, he says, my dad told me up front, he said, Greg, this is a business where if you come into it as a second genera generation wrestler and you come into it as the owner's son, you are going to be a target. You are going to have disgruntled wrestlers who don't like what Vern did to them or don't like their payday or don't like the spot they have on the card or the push they are or aren't getting. And he said, they're going to take a shot at you. And so Greg told me, he said, with Billy Robinson and Vern Gagne, they worked with him a lot to make sure that he could take care of himself. And Greg said, there were a number of times I'd be in the ring with somebody and we'd be going at it. And the guy would get a little ticked. The guy would smart off and say, here, give this to your old man, or this is for your old man. And he said, he'd stretch me wrong or punch me and hurt me. He says, 
But my dad told me that I had to be prepared for that. So the thing that bugs me is we all know Greg wasn't a big guy. He was about six foot, but he was a string bean. For lack mm-hmm. of that's not a, that's not trying to be mean. From a wrestling build standpoint, he wasn't he wasn't built like the wrestlers of that era. No. Um, and Vern had to give him the ability and Billy to take care of himself. So I I can tell you for fact that there were a lot of guys who, when they tried to get cute with Greg, Greg would show them, don't do it because I know what I can take care of. you. I can take care of myself. But Greg had, excuse me, Greg had to prove that all the time. But when it comes to Greg, as we get into the AWA here, is... I've heard the question, and I always thought about it, because you mentioned it there a little bit, being the promoter's son and such. Do you think he would have been more successful in certain aspects if he didn't work his whole career or most of his career in the AWA because of that whole being the promoter's son? Well, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, I had actually thought about that very scenario early on that maybe it would have been a good idea for Greg to adopt a different name and go somewhere else, you know, with all the ties that Vern had in the business, he could have had his kid in the business. There were lots of relatives in business that people that outside people and sometimes even the wrestlers themselves didn't know that so-and-so was related. So yeah, probably it could have worked. What, you know, would he have gotten the same success? I don't know if his size would have been a deterrent. Let me tell you this. I will give Vern Gagne credit because I think he was wise in that he knew Greg was not big. He knew he couldn't put the title on, the the, the singles title, and make it believable. And also to not have it appear that there's nepotism. I mean, even when people knew that it was a work, you, you, you put the title on him, well, he got the title because his old man's the owner of the company, you know? So I I think Greg could have, I think Greg was good where he could have went. And you got to remember back then in, now this is in the early seventies when Greg broke into the business, we had 25 territories just in the United States. So Greg wouldn't have been uh, unable to find a place to wrestle. But then let me ask you this. I'm going to reverse this. on you. Why would Greg want to go somewhere else? He was here. He had a home. His, his dad, uh, it, it would it would seem, you know, it'd be the same as uh, I, work, I worked in a bank most of my working career. The owner of the bank had his sons and his daughter involved in the bank. And his they, they were going to be the heir apparents. You know, it, it's just the way it was. It's a family business. So why, why should it be different in wrestling? But a lot of people on the outside, they get jealous because, well, they only get what they get because they, they, you know, their dad's the owner. Well, it's not that way at all. Greg, Greg earned his way. And uh, would he have done better somewhere else? I don't know. I'll tell you one guy that would have. I mean, he, well, he did good here. He didn't have to leave. Was Larry Hennig. But Larry could have went. I, I mean this in my heart and soul. And I loved Larry Hennig to death. And, uh, I talked with him just days before he passed away and uh, just, just the greatest guy in the world. But Larry, he could have went, and I say this, I've said this for 30 years, 40 years. Larry could have went to any of the 25 territories and he could have been a headliner and he could have taken and, and been the star in the territory. But Larry, and this brings back to what you alluded to earlier with Billy Robinson. Larry was a family guy. Yeah. Larry was extremely, Nick Bockwinkle told me one time, he said, the worst thing a pro wrestler could do is get married because it's not conducive to a, to a successful relationship. He says, we're on the road six, eight, 10 months a year. He says, we come home. We don't realize we had a kid. Next time we come home, we don't realize the kid graduated. And that was Nick. And he, and, but Larry was one of these guys that was very close to home. He, 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 his family came first and he had, he had, uh, well, what do we have? We had Kurt, we had, uh, Joe or not Joe, Kurt, um, uh, 
I'm forgetting the names of his kids. Anyway, his idea was he wanted to be close to home. And so he wouldn't travel. Not that he didn't travel, but he wouldn't go to other territories. He wouldn't leave. And ironically about Larry, Vern Gagne used him in main events from day one. Larry was always in the top matches with Harley Race on his own uh, as a challenger to Vern with Lars Anderson, with Dusty Rhodes, with Joe LaDuke, with other partners, and again on his own. Uh, Larry was always up near the top of the card or in the main event. So Vern never buried it. Now, Vern used him. He made money with him. That was the deal there, too. You got to understand a promoter and a wrestler, they're there to make money for each other. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's business. And if I do the best I can and I make more money for the promoter, the better it's going to be for me down the road. So Vern never buried Larry, but here's the deal. Larry complained. He just, let's just outright say he bitched all the time about working for Vern Gagne. I don't like working for Vern Gagne. I burn this and burn that. And I, and I used to just think, why doesn't he go somewhere else then? You know, if you don't like working for the boss, for the company, why would you torture yourself and stay with the company when there's a million other places to go? I changed jobs a few times in my life because I didn't care for the management or the or or a manager. I I left. Life's too short to do that. But Larry never did. So in the end, I say, you know what? Larry used Vern because Vern always paid him well. Larry told me that. He said, Vern never, I, I got paid well with him. But he just didn't like Vern Gagne. I don't know if it was a jealousy thing because Vern owned the company and Larry didn't. I don't know. But uh, it didn't make sense to me. Well, but that, is, was... that said, Larry was, Larry was a great guy. And Harley Race said in oh, his book, God. if you have Grandma the Harley Race. <laughs> yeah, well, let's do the R's. But if, if you had, if you have Harley Race's book, Larry makes a comment, or Harley's book, if you make, he makes a comment in there, he said he wanted, when Larry Hennig and Harley Race were together, and they were together five years in the AWA, and they were in main events and champions like three, four times, they were, they were absolutely a team that you had to see to understand how good they both were and so good together. That's, that's just key. Um, Harley wanted to go on the road. And he, he told Larry, let's, let's travel. They did travel to Japan once, and they did go to Australia. But Larry didn't want to leave Minnesota. And, and finally, Harley wanted to get out and go on the road. And Larry, or Harley says in his book, he says, you know, if Larry wanted to travel, we'd have never parted. So, and they were friends to the very end, too, by the way. They, they were legit close friends. But Larry, and God bless him, he wanted to be with his family. There's nothing, there's nothing more sacred to my heart than, than a dad who wants to be there for his family and support his family. You heard my background. I, I would have given an arm and a leg to have that. So I, I applaud Larry. But don't don't kick the boss in the teeth if you if you're getting a push and when there's so yeah. many other opportunities for you. Before I get into Vern, you know, it's a and Vern, his story's been told, but you know, he was known for being on the Dumont network from his amateur yeah. background, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> but you kind of mentioned there with Larry about getting paid well and stuff like that. And obviously today, these guys are 1099s, all that fun stuff. You know, yeah. Independent contractors. And I have it that we could have a three hour discussion on that. But oh then, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> how, obviously you weren't in the ring, but how, did these guys find their worth because whether you were like you said you were in the banking industry or if I were a plumber or electrician or work at McDonald's whatever the case is you know there's a certain pay structure and whatnot so with professional wrestlers how did they know their value and say I think I'm worth this because i bring x to the promotion whether it's a territory a national brand like wwe aew whatever how does one f know their value would you say well first of all i think you have to go back if we're going to talk to kayfabe europe first of all there were no real contracts 
any handshake deal. It was it truly was more of a handshake deal. Now, when you've got three thousand wrestlers, we're talking guys that are mid card to near the top to top wrestlers that are traveling the the territories. Obviously, how do you know your worth? Part of it's the reputation that you've left behind you in other territories. There's, there's, you know, you get a guy like Vern Gagne, you had promoters like Vern Gagne, Eddie Graham, Paul Bosch, Don Owen, Roy Shire, Bill Watts, Sam Muchnick, and then, you know, we, Jim Crockett, we go down the board. Uh, Fritz von Erich, you name all these promoters, the Sheik in Detroit, the Bruiser in Indianapolis, all of these guys that are promoters. You, you you know the word out there who's who's getting over in a certain territory and, and who is uh who's gonna make you money or can you work this gimmick here and make it work? The key thing is when you come in, and I'll relate this to you know how you determine your pay, in those days, the wrestlers knew when they come into a territory. Um this is something that I brought up a few times, and I think it's always important for for newer fans to understand. Every single territory of the 25 that we toss out there, every single territory had two or three or four or five wrestlers that what I always referred to and most of the boys did too as a mainstay. So in the AWA, we had Vern Gagne, of course, being a mainstay. He owned the company. He was here forever. And then we ended up with the crusher. Reggie Lasowski, who was here for most of the 30 years of the AWA, on and off. He never really left the territory. And you had Mad Dog Vashon, who was a semi-regular all the time. And then you had Larry Hennig, as we mentioned. And then when we got into the uh, the 70s, we had Nick Bockwinkle, obviously, that became a mainstay. And uh, so what, what happened with these mainstays in any territory, you would bring in wrestlers to work against them. And let's just use the Crusher, for example. The Crusher okay. came here in 1962, and he stayed until 1986. Now, any bad guy, well, at, in the beginning, the Crusher was a heel for three years. But as he as he morphed into the baby face and the, the power draw at the gate that he was, any bad guy that came in, whatever heel that came in, some new heel to the territory. The objective was, is that they were eventually going to have to face the crusher. If they wanted to get a chance at Vern Gagne, who was the champion. It was all like, you know, you got to earn this guy, this guy. And the like crusher in my was standing in my, When I was growing up, it was like you had to go through Tito to get the Hogan and such. So Exactly right. Yeah. So the, it was the the, the wrestlers that came into any of these territories, generally speaking, with but rare exceptions, a wrestler would come into the territory for six months to a year to two years max. After that time frame, they were phased out and they moved on to another territory. And by that time, you've already got another couple guys that have come in and they're the next ones coming up. Um, on the East Coast, we'll, we'll switch gears a second. Bruno San Martino was the champion from 63 to 71. And mm -hmm. during the course of that almost eight years, the um, I say almost because he, it would have had to go till May of 71 to be eight years, and he lost it in January. But Bruno was the top guy. And any heel who came through the WWWF, which it was still back then, any heel that was built up, eventually would have a match with Bruno. They'd, they'd run the ranks. They'd eventually get to Bruno. They'd run it around the horn. He'd have a couple Madison Square Garden main events. Then they'd go to the smaller towns. Then eventually that heel was gone and the new heel is ready to take over. And it was just, it was recycling all the time. Bruno was your mainstay. Mm -hmm. um, but you always had these, these bullies. And when you look at Bruno's opponents through the years, oh my gosh, he had Tarzan Tyler and Crazy Lou Graham and the Mongols and and uh, Ivan Koloff and and the Kentucky Butcher and Gorilla Monsoon and you know we can go on and the Sheik and Killer Kowalski and on and on and it was always the new biggest deal in town gonna gonna take Bruno down. So that's the way the territories will work. But these guys, 
when they came into the business or into the territory, they knew what they were going to be making. Whatever the, whatever the salary was, it was up to them to agree or not. And in most cases, in most promotions, they, that salary was fulfilled. I mean, it wasn't that a lot of times they did get paid per card or, or per month or whatever, but a lot of times in the territory, they'd get a monthly check or however the pay schedule was. And that's what they would get. So when you talk about the worth, um, you've got to go into the territory and show number one, that you can get over with the fans, whether you're a heel or a baby, if you can make them hate you, they hate you so much. They want to pay and go to the box office to see your butt get kicked. That's great. Or if you can make them love you so much because you're the guy that's going to finally kick that so-and-so's rear end. You're, 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 you're awesome. You're incredible. You're over. Well, that's, that's the combination. It's just good versus evil. And if you can prove your worth, but eventually everything gets old and stale and the gimmicks, you know, so with our mainstays, Mad Dog, Crusher, Bachwinkle, Hennig, Vern, um, all of the opponents that came through the AWA in some form or time or another were in the ring with those guys. And then it was time to move on to the next territory and you show your worth down there. And, and the wrestlers shared talent too. Uh, one of the things that Vern used to do is he'd have his, his camps and he'd train rookies. In the 60s, he'd just take one guy or two guys and train them. As the 70s moved on every year, a couple of years, he'd have a camp with three, four, five, six guys in it. I will tell you, a lot of times they started out with a dozen guys. I'm going to be a wrestler. You know, they're coming, I'm going to be a wrestler. By the time they're in the end of the first couple of days, they're left with their tail between their legs because they they mm -hmm. don't tell you in the beginning what they're doing. They're, they're hurt. They're stretching you. They're making you, they want to know that you have the gumption to stay. And that's what Vern's whole thing was. But eventually with Vern's rookies, when they would graduate from his camp, you know, um, he'd use them on his cards as rookies. And when I look at the 60s, we had rookies by the names of Bob Ramstead, Jim Rashke, Larry Hainimi, Gene Anderson, Al Rogowski, uh Buddy Smith. Yvonne Robert, well, he was actually Bobby Brunel when he was here. A guy named Bob Windham. These are all guys that Vern had a hand in training or did train. Well, what happens is, is that once they have their first few matches, he has the guys come into the ring and he has them work with them in their preliminary matches. And then eventually Vern's formula was he'd get on the phone with another promoter, Eddie, Will Eddie Graham down in Florida or call up Fritz or somebody. Jim Crockett he says, you know, I got this, I got this kid up here, young kid, man, he's, he's good, but he needs some, he needs some seasoning. I like, you know, can you take him down there and have him work with some of your boys? And the beauty of the territories was that not only working with the wrestlers in your own territory, but going to other territories, you can pick up so much from all the other wrestlers and the veterans and the styles and the and styles. And you hone your own, you take from this one what works for you, or you take from that, you, you leave what that one doesn't do for you. And when Vern started with uh, guys like Greg and Jim Brunzel and Ric Flair, Osro Vasiri, Bob Remus, who became Sergeant Slaughter, uh, uh, Ricky Steamboat started as Dick Blood, trained by Vern. They, they get in these first matches, and when you're in the ring with guys like Red Bastine and Ivan Koloff and Nick Bockwinkle and Billy Robinson and Edward Carpentier and Paul Mad Diamond Dog and, and Mad Dog and all these guys, you if you're going to stick with the business and you have the, the bones to do it, uh, you can't help but get better. Don Morocco is another one. He got some <laughs> of his very earliest training with in the – AWA. And when Don Morocco, when I first saw him as a young kid, he'd had some wrestling background a little bit, but Vern and Billy Robinson worked with Don Morocco when he came into the business. And when you, when, when Don is working night after night with 
Bockwinkle, Stevens, Rhodes, Murdoch, Crusher, Stevens, Mad Dog, Koloff, Superstar Graham. My God, how can you not become good unless you're just a loser? So yeah. I want to go back to Vern for a second. And sure. obviously he bought in, and I guess it was 1959 from uh, Dennis Stecker with uh, him and what Wally Carbo. And Correct. was it Vern that pushed Dennis to sell his shares that he got from his father? Or how did that work? What had actually happened was uh, Dennis Stecker and Tony Stecker's wife, so Dennis's dad, or a mother, Mrs. Stecker, um, they basically wanted to sell the territory, which back then was well, it's, it always remained the Minneapolis Boxing and Wrestling Club. That was mm -hmm. the, the parent company. Um, through the 50s, when the promotion here in Minneapolis, it was it was uh, under the NWA umbrella, I say, because we, we got Sam Muchnick at the time sending us the NWA champion periodically. And it was Pat O'Connor at the time, right? Well, Pat O'Connor was yeah later in the in the, in 1959. But what Vern did was Vern started out being Minneapolis born and bred, and quite the hero, I might add. You know, he went to Robbinsdale High School and the University of Minnesota. He was a football player. He was a, a wrestler, and uh, he was World a War II vet. World War. He was a, he was in the Marines. Yep, and. Uh, he wanted to go into football, but he got a contract. You know, I always laugh when people talk today or people say today, because we all know the sports contracts today for baseball, football, and the other two major sports. My God, they make more money than any of us can ever fathom. But in those days, you'd get a football contract for 6000 a year in the early 50s. And, you know, that may sound like peanuts today, but back then that still was a decent salary. But Vern took up wrestling and uh, being Minnesota, and Tony Stecker brought him in. Tony Stecker, his brother Joe Stecker, was a great shooter, cooker back in the 30s. And uh, Tony was the promoter. So obviously he used Vern sporadically. I've been going through the last week. I've been going through uh, St. Paul programs. And I was, I was kind of surprised from the 50s how little Vern actually wrestled here in the fifties, at least in St. Paul, but he was a big deal because he was all over the country. That Dumont network that you talk about wrestling, you know, we only had our local TV programs in our towns. And, and back in those days, any big city only had maybe three or four TV stations. Most here in Minnesota, we had ABC, NBC, and CBS. And then we had an independent station. And that was it. Um, and wrestling would be on usually the independent station, but every town had their wrestling. And Vern in those days was traveling around. The true story is, is that Vern wanted, he believed he had a Billy Robinson syndrome to a, a minor respect. He felt he should be the heavyweight champion because of his credentials. And he was good. And here's the thing. And I tell this to people, I say, if you don't believe it, we can go and look at the attendance records. Whenever Vern Gagne was on a car in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and right up to his retirement match in 1981, when his name was on the marquee, there were more people in attendance. He sold tickets. He would, People respected him. And he was the real deal. He he believed in his heart that wrestling should come first and a gimmick should be second. And when he trained his wrestlers, he said, I'm going to teach you how to wrestle, but if you need a gimmick, we'll work with that later. I want you to be a wrestler. He liked wrestlers. And that's what the AWA was mostly. So we get to 1959. Tony Stecker passed away in 1954. And Dennis... Uh, the son took over. Wally Carbo was part of it. And we get to 1959. Vern had wanted to be NWA champion. And for the last three years, from 59 up to about 1950, back to 1956, 
Luthes wouldn't lose to Vern Gagne. Now I'm going to share, I can share a story with you. You know, I think you and I could talk for the next three days. We might have, we might have to break this up into part two, but keep go with the story. But, but the deal with Luthes, Luthes was, was a man that you had to know him to understand him and to respect him. And I don't think there was a single wrestler that ever took the business more seriously, professional wrestling, than Lou Thez did. He believed that a wrestler should hold the title. You shouldn't have some, some mask guy. You shouldn't have some gorilla, some bad dog, some, some, you know. He believed that a wrestler should be the champion. And the key was is that Lou was the real deal. He, yeah. he was, you know, I, I, I would have thought it would have been fun in their primes. In their primes, it would have been fun to see Lou wrestle Billy Robinson. Hmm. Or, or, or Lou wrestle Carl Gotch, who was another shooter. It would, have been, it would have been something because those guys, man, they could make it real. Let me ask you something on that uh, train of thought with Lou, uh, with the wrestler stand, being the champ and all. Yeah. Could, would that have been where Bob Backlund learned that mentality because and the reason I ask that because years later when the whole Hogan came over to the Northeast out of the AWA again and the transition was Backlund to the Iron Sheik then Sheik to Hogan Bob didn't mind dropping to the Sheik because of his athletic background being a real athlete where Hogan was more showmanship. So would you say that Backlund got the idea from Thez? Well, I don't know that he got it from Thez, but I, I will tell you that. You see the connection I'm making though, right? I, I definitely do it. Now let me explain that this way. It would have been unlikely that they were going to allow Hulk Hogan, who was a baby face, defeat Bob Backlund, who was a baby face. So, so we had, had the to transition. Have, we had to have the transition. Um, Bob agreed to do the, the job for Cosro Vasari, which made sense because Cosro was the real deal as well. And then, of course, Cosro being the heel, he would drop. But that was that was the plan. That, that, that just was going to work. It, they wouldn't have put Hogan against Backlund even if Backlund would have agreed to drop the title to him, that, that just in that time frame, it still wasn't going to, it wasn't going to work for a baby to take from a baby or a heel from a, maybe a heel from a heel. I don't know. But back to the Fez thing, Lou Fez, he basically became a policeman for the NWA. I've heard that. He had been in the, he had been in the business for 20, 25 years and he still could go. I mean, the guy was, approaching 50 years old and he could still go and make it real and Hell, so 70 wasn't he when he had well, like a last match yeah by the by the end of the the thing yeah but i mean when we're talking in the in the 50s you know the guy yeah. started in the in the 20s the yeah. late 20s so by the 50s you know he's got 30 years in the business but he was their go-to guy for the nwa when the nwa was originally formed the, the alliance national wrestling alliance Forty-eight, nineteen forty-eight. It was Luthes that got the nod to be the first champion, supposedly uniform, unified. Now I'm going to tell you this again. As I said, we could talk for hours. The NWA wasn't as always as cohesive as people like to portray it being through the years. There was politics. There was there were promotions that weren't getting the champion as promised. You know, because the NWA was supposed to ship the guy out here, ship him out there, ship him over there. There were guys that didn't. There were other guys that got him more often. So we could we could do a whole story on that. I won't even say pro wrestling USA, but that's a whole other well, yeah, same. A whole different thing. <laughs> but, the, but the deal with Fez was he wasn't going to lose the title. His his deal was he he never had a problem dropping the title. But number one, he wasn't going to lose it to a, a, what he called a performer, not a wrestler. So Lou Thez losing to Buddy Rogers, that wasn't going to happen. Lou <laughs> wouldn't do it, period. He just wouldn't do it. And it wasn't that Buddy wasn't deserving. He, Lou wasn't going to do it because Buddy wasn't a wrestler in the sense that Lou was. But now here's the deal with Vern. 
I had a chance in 1999 to sit with both of these two in the same room. And we talked on a couch. And they mutually loved each other, but they mutually were not ever going to put each other over. They, they just, they, they just, for whatever reason, and unfortunately, whenever Vern wrestled against Lou the, the six times during the 50s that he did meet him, Lou did go over. But Vern had an issue. And Vern wanted to be champion. And Lou said, I'm not going to lose it to Vern. I'll lose it to somebody else, but I won't lose it to Vern. So there was that rub. This was legit behind the scenes. You got this animosity building up. The politics. Their, ex their excuse was Vern was too small. Now, Vern was not quite six foot, but he was damn close. And he was, for a wrestler of the era, he was built fine. And you talk about the Vern Gagne that I saw in the 50s, the late 50s and the 60s. I'm telling you, this guy, he flew here, flew there, flew everywhere. He was a, he was a wizard in the ring. Hold, counter hold, drop kicks. Vern was the real deal. And so he, he, he drew money. So we get, to, we get to the later 50s. The excuse has been used that the AWA was founded out of the... Uh, deal with the NWA being under, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they were under scrutiny for being a monopoly, the Justice Department. It was a real deal. The Justice yeah. Department had stepped in that you're, you're controlling the business, which as a side note, I will say, what does the WWE do today? Okay. <laughs> but anyway, so eventually, as 1959 was coming around, Dennis Stecker and his mom, who was not really involved in the promotion, but she had the, the interest in the promotion. She had the stock, if you want to call it that. They agreed they were going to sell to Vern Gagne and Wally Carbo. It worked out fine because the NWA used it as an excuse saying, OK, we're not a monopoly. We got another promotion starting up here. They agreed to give up what they called the Minneapolis territory. Now you have to remember Minneapolis was the headquarters, but they ran cards in Winnipeg, and Chicago and Milwaukee and all over, but it was Minneapolis. Any wrestler who ever worked for the AWA would tell you when I went to Minneapolis, they never said I went to the AWA. They say I went to Minneapolis or I wanted to go to Minneapolis. So just so you know that. So Vern, he had the, he had the backing and he and Wally Carbo originally went in as 50-50 partners. Now, the, the whole thing started there where Vern wanted to be champion. Yeah, he, that was his whole objective. He was going to buy the company and he was going to say, all right, I'm the champion. Outsiders would never know it. Because in that days, it was kayfabe and Wally Carbo. It, to the fans' eyes in the from the early 60s on, Wally Carbo he was the promoter. He was the owner of the AWA. Vern was never mentioned. I mean, I'm sure there were people that knew it, but it was never part of the deal. And they had a legit thing. It was legit, but it was worked. Let's put it that way. Vern was starting the AWA. And they put out, it was real presented, but it was fake because they put out a challenge, Vern and Wally put out a challenge in uh, May of 1960. This was, what, eight months after they took over the uh, Minneapolis office. And so they were still getting the NWA champion, Pat O'Connor, in because they were still NWA. There was no AWA yet. And they put, they put forth, and this is the part that I have fun with because people say, God, there he goes again. We're going to go about this again. But Vern was going to be champion, so they put it, put forth the fake story that they had issued a challenge. Vern Gagne, Wally Carbo, and other promoters is the way it's written in my programs. They have issued a challenge to Pat O'Connor, the NWA champion, and Sam Muchnick for Pat O'Connor or whoever is the champion at the time 
to defend the title to Vern Gagne within 90 days, or Wally Carbo and these other promoters would no longer recognize Pat O'Connor as the world champion. Now, this gets confusing because if you go to websites, Google title histories, you'll see that there's some of them that are wrong, and they'll say Pat O'Connor was the first AWA champion because they recognized him as champion, but it was the NWA. So this fake three-month, 90-day period goes by, and they played it out in the programs. And I have the programs that show this, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Pat O'Connor ignores challenge. No calls from Pat O'Connor. Sam Wichnick not answering this phone. You know, we've heard nothing. So when we get to the end of the 90 days, August of 60, it's announced that the AWA has been formed. And because Pat O'Connor refused to meet Vern Gagne, who Wally Carbo and these other promoters felt were the rightful, he was champion by default, and he became the first AWA champion. So there's the part that people are going to say, Shire did it again. He brought up the Pat O'Connor was not the first AWA champion because it says that on websites and it's wrong. Because we know that everything was, online is true. Come on now, well, of George. Course. Well, of course, of course. That, that's the problem. I, I get people all the time. They say, uh, well, they show me a site. And they say, well, it's right here on the site. I say, well, okay, good. But let me show you. I have the articles of incorporation, uh, copies of them, articles of incorporation of the American Wrestling Alliance, as it was originally called. And then somewhere in the late 60s, very early 70s, it just kind of morphed into association, American Wrestling Association. I have no idea how that happened. They never, Vern Gagne later told me it was always association. So, you know, he believed his own, his own uh, story. But well, Vern was the champion and he drew well through the 60s. Yes, he had the championship the most. And when it was time for him to eventually slow down, uh, he picked, he did pick Nick Bockwinkel. Mm -hmm. He brought Nick Bockwinkel in here and he told Nick up front that it's my plan. Wally and Vern told this to Nick. He says, it's our plan that you will win the title. And uh, I'm sure it could have went sour. Something could have happened, but that was the plan and it worked. And And Nick told me, this was the difference between Nick and Billy Robinson. Nick told trust. me trust Nick and Nick and Vern outside the ring were extremely close, but Nick told me this. And I swear to you, he told me this. I, in fact, I was, I can remember I was at an Embers restaurant one night with him when he told me this. Uh, anybody remember Embers? <laughs> uh, anyway, he told me, he said, Vern owned the promotion. I was his employee. And whatever he asked me to do, I did it. That was my job. And as long as I was paid, that was fine. Brings up an interesting story, and we'll we'll jump ahead. Not that we've never, ever done that anywhere. But um, I've always believed that when you work for a company, uh, and I'll use my own banking career. When you work for a company, you do what they ask you to do. They're paying you to work for them. Now, if they're asking you to do something that's illegal, then, of course, I'd say don't do it. But if they're asking you to do the job that they want done, if you don't agree with it, move on. Kind of goes back to our Larry Hennig scenario. But you have the right to move on. You disagree with the boss. You disagree with the direction of the company. You disagree with. So in the wrestler's case, you don't like your push. You don't like the pay you're getting. You, you don't like uh, that you're not getting enough dates or whatever the story is. You don't like that you have to take the fall in the match. Okay. You either live with it, take the pay and move on. And I will tell you this. There were a lot of guys in the AWA in the, in the, in the sixties and seventies, a lot of guys that came into the territory. I'll use Crazy Luke Graham, for example. Crazy Luke Graham was a, a big star on the West Coast. He was the WWA champion out there. Good draw. He was a, 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 cha a challenger to Bruno San Martino on the, on the East Coast in the 60s. I think 64 or 65, without looking it up. 
Um, but he was he was well paid. He was he was a well respected worker. When he came to Vern, never got to main events. He was a preliminary. He was not a preliminary guy. He was right in the middle of the card or the semi windup. Never got to the main events. But you know what? He was paid. And Crazy Luke himself told me this back in it was about two thousand one, two thousand two. Um, he told me, he said, when I worked for Vern, he says, I didn't have the same push, but I made good living. I, I, I got paid well. So he was getting paid. All he cared about was getting a paycheck and doing a job. And, and most of the wrestlers, that's what they wanted. It didn't matter whether they won or lost. It mattered whether they were getting paid and they were satisfied. With it. When you've got an employee who tells you, I won't do what you ask me to do. To me, that's insubordination. And, and the employer the employer should have every right to say, okay, fine, there's the door. I mean, and and we had wrestlers that came to the AWA. Uh, let's bring you, this is, this is a famous thing that a lot of fans will understand. I, I got to know Stan Hansen, not really well, but I got to know him and he's a nice guy. Are you talking really, the total thing? Yeah. Okay. Stan's a nice guy. He's mellow. He's a nice guy. But during his wrestling years, Stan was tough to work with from a promotional standpoint. He was one of the few rebels that he didn't want to do what promoters asked him to do all the time. He worried more about his push, his place on the card, whether he won, whether he lost. He wanted what he wanted. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. So we talk about the Vern Gagne scenario. There are many different stories that have been told, and there will be many more that will be told. Somewhere between all the stories and the versions, there's that line of truth. Vern put the title on Stan Hansen. I'm going to tell you right now, and I've said this in other podcasts. Vern put the title on Stan out of desperation. Vern would have never put the title on a guy like Stan Hansen five years earlier and backwards in his career. He put it on Stan out of desperation because in 1985, Vern was in the battle of his life against the WWF. It still was WWF. They were robbing the territories. They were taking down the territories. The business had changed so drastically. Vince McMahon was paying promotions to not, or promoters or paying wrestlers to not show up for cards. He was buying auditoriums to not rent to Vern. Vern was in a battle that people don't even understand. He needed a very visible and a very uh, big name. He felt he did. And he was going to do it with Stan Hansen. Now, I've said this before. Some of the people will say, well, this is rerun of what Shire has said in the past. But it goes with all of our story. Nick Bockwinkle and Jack Lanza who were close to Vern in those days, they both told him, Vern, don't put the title on Stan. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a, a nightmare. Don't do it. Vern did it because he needed the national reputation. So the problem was, is that Stan was getting a lot of his income from Japan, working for Giant mm -hmm. Baba. And no fault to Stan, he made more money there than he was making in the States. Vern worked it out with Baba <coughs> that we would use use Stan Hansen as the champion. And when he comes to Japan, you can use him in AWA matches, but he's still my employee. Well, it got to the point where Vern was getting to use Stan less and less. And he wanted to use him. And Stan was going to go to Japan. And Vern, behind the scenes, had had enough. He went to Stan Hansen in Denver. Nick Bockwinkle was to be Stan's opponent that night, former champion. Nick was brought into the to the circle. And I, I guess in hindsight, I would say Vern would have been better off bringing Stan into the fold before he did, but he didn't. But they went into the shower. That was the office in the in the locker room. You went into the shower to talk privately. And no, the shower wasn't on, folks. They, they, they had a business meeting. But Vern called Stan and Nick into the shower and, and 
Vern basically told Stan, he says, you're going to Japan. You're going to be gone the next eight weeks. I want you to drop the belt tonight to Nick. And Stan, this was the uprising. Stan says, that ain't going to happen. No way. I, I, did, I, I should have been brought in. He may have had a point. He should have been in the loop on this. Nick knew that he was going to take the title that night. But the bottom line was, Stan said, no. I, I'm going over to Japan. I've been advertised as champion over there. I'm going over there, and I'm not going to drop the belt. Vern says, well, the hell you are. It's my title. You are. And then we know the rest. Stan grabbed the belt, left the Denver Auditorium. Vern was left holding the bag, legit. You know, we've heard that thing on programs, programs subject to change. Well, Vern had to go to the ring, and on, as they say on the come, had to decide what he was going to do. Now. Armchair, armchair quarterbackers will tell you, well, he should have had a tournament. He should have had Nick wrestle somebody that night in an elimination. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all hindsight. Nick Byrne went out and said that Stan Hansen was here, ladies and gentlemen. He has refused to defend the title to Nick Bockwinkle. He left the building. And by default, I have no other measure but to award the title to Bockwinkle. That was the decision. So the thing about that, I, I feel that Stan was wrong. And, he, and all I'm going to say is this. When Stan worked for Vern on his cards here in the States, he was Vern's employee. When he went over to Japan and he wrestled for Japan's Baba's promotion, Baba was his boss. He did what Baba asked him to do. The only thing Baba never had the power to do was change the AWA title over there without Vern's, obviously, knowledge or permission. So, But he was free to use the AWA champion and, and introduce him as that. That was the agreement. So, But Stan, his allegiance entirely was to Baba. Misguided or not, that's up to him to decide. But my version of this is... Vern was his boss, and he should have lost the title to Nick. Now, here's the deal. If you look up Japanese results when he was over on his tour, he was introduced as AWA champion, and he defended the title. And those Japanese fans saw that. You can't tell them they didn't. But he wasn't the champion because Vern had already stripped him of it over here. Exactly. On that note, we are at the two-hour mark, minus our th- Wow. Here. Yeah, we can do another two based on the notes I have. Can I bring you back for part two to do the rest I, of everything? I think you have you realize already that I, I have no end to talking about this stuff. Me as well. So, so yes, by all means, let's put it on the schedule and you tell me when you want to do it. Wednesday nights still work good for me if that does for you. We will do uh, that the then next night. we will do it next Wednesday then. Wanna do it next uh, Wednesday? Yeah, but I do want to mention at the end of this part one here is the Facebook group. So what is that? My wrestling page, my Facebook wrestling page is George Shires Wrestling Time Machine. Full name. Remember to put the C in Shire. Otherwise, you'll you won't find it. But George Shires Wrestling Time Machine. And it's basically old wrestling all pre. 1990. Anything before 1990. Um, Stories, programs, clippings, photos, conversation, education. Yes. And obviously, I'll share a link with that as well. But George, thank you so much. I love it. I'm looking forward to part two. Oh. Same same bad time, same bad channel. (laughs) Okay, Adam West. (laughs) Hey there, Friday fans. We know how much you enjoy the movies. Enjoy grabbing your Friday merchandise. 
and interacting with the Friday family, whether it be at conventions or during our particular watch-alongs. Well, when you're looking to get yourself masks, why not check out our friends over at Camp Blood Customs out of New York State and order your specific custom mask from any of the films. All orders are made specifically. Your needs and wants are. Make sure you find Camp Blood Customs on Facebook, Instagram, and all over social media and order yours today. Hi, this is Baby Doll, your perfect 10. And whenever you want to hear the best about wrestling, memories, stories, whatever we have to say, listen to Crazy Tearing Radio. They've got it all. <laughs> 